Welcome to Talk World Radio, a half-hour discussion of politics as if the people mattered. I'm David Swanson. This week on Talk World Radio, we are talking about Palestine. Our guest who has been on before is Dan Kovalik, whose latest book is The Case for Palestine, Why It Matters and Why You Should Care, with a foreword by George Galloway. His previous books include No More War, which I just included in a yet-to-be-published article for a website that asks authors to recommend five books on a theme and my theme oh my goodness david thank you uh, thank you i hope it helps uh dan kovalik is a labor and human rights lawyer who has taught international human rights at the university of pittsburgh school of law dan welcome back to talk world radio thank you david i'm really happy to be here thanks for coming on uh Maybe we should talk. Uh, we were just talking about this this red line rally that we were both at, where we put up a red line around the White House because Joe Biden had failed to have a red line. Usually, a red line is a horrible, horrible thing, a, a media concoction to get a president into a war because something happened that you know was a good enough trigger to justify a mass murder. A red line was supposed to be a good thing here, wasn't it? Yes. I mean, his red lines, he's had a couple. Apparently, uh, at least he claimed if Israel crossed those red lines, it would be an occasion for the United States to stop supporting this war. So in that sense, the red line was good. But as you know, uh, those red lines have been crossed, including invading Rafa. That was a big red line. We're now way into the, to the to the invasion of Rafa, which took place in earnest, I guess, beginning May se- May seventh. But frankly, it, it, Israel was attacking Rafa even before that. May or June? Uh, May seventh is I, I double checked that it was May. So it's been over a month now. Wow. That uh, that they've been so yeah that was so that was the week that uh. Remember that Hamas had accepted an Egyptian brokered peace deal, and Israel's response was, "Okay, then we're going to shut the border uh, with Egypt, and we're going to attack Rafa." So it's been over a month. This was the previous agreement, uh, and then there was the Biden Israel one that wasn't really Israel's that that came after that one, right? That's correct. That's correct. And then the other uh, red line was supposed to be no U.S. boots on the ground in Gaza. And, and it's very clear there are boots on the ground. I think and I think we don't know how many boots or what they're doing. But in the one, uh, the big massacre that took place at, at one of the refugee camps where over 270 Palestinians were killed, it's very clear that there were U.S troops there in some capacity involved um there's actually a young i don't know if you saw this video a young man a young palestinian who was there talked about even that he claims to have seen americans actually in the refugee camp carrying out attacks with the israelis now i don't think that's been confirmed but um but certainly there were there were troops there uh in theater so that was another red line he promised not to cross, and that's been crossed. So thus the reason for that rally we were at to say, hey, if Biden is not going to hold that ro- the, to the red lines, we're going to be the red lines. The American people are going to be the red line, right? We're going to be the ones to stop this war. And I thought that was a brilliant, brilliant way to to couch that protest. And I think we got a lot of good uh, publicity, David. Uh, I think people understood it. The press seemed to understand what we were doing. So that was great. Uh, Better than average, I would say. It's a low bar for the U.S. corporate media, (laughs) I think. Um, But, but, you know, obviously a significant percentage of the Israeli military is made up of U.S. citizens and people with with citizenship in the U.S. and Israel. Um, When you say U.S. troops, you mean U.S. military in U.S. military uniform, right? That's correct. And there are actually, there's uh, at least photos, if not videos, of uh, of American troops uh, at an American helicopter 
on the shore there of Gaza, near the dock that Biden set up, the alleged humanitarian uh, pier, which we can talk about that, um, receiving the four Israeli captives that were rescued in that operation. So again, there was there was real intimate connection between United States official military and the IDF in that instance. Dan Kovalik, let's talk about this this peer because everybody said everybody who made any sense or had any knowledge said you ought to just be letting all the necessary supplies in by ground. There's no way this could make up a fraction of what's needed and could easily be let in uh, by ground if Israel wasn't trying to uh, starve people. Uh, and, and some people worried that uh, Israel would actually bomb the thing. Uh, of course, the, the waves took care of that for a while, but uh, now, People are worried that it's not just a, a PR stunt. Uh, it's actually to assist in the war or to assist in the ethnic cleansing. What? How do you make sense of this thing? And what do we know about the motivations and likely future uses of it? Yes, I think we don't know for sure, but we can surmise a few things. First of all, as you say, everyone, any honest person will say the easiest way to get aid and really the only um, viable way to get aid to the Palestinians are through the land borders, including the Rafa crossing with Egypt, which has been closed since May 7. Apparently right now, on last count, there are 1,800 aid trucks lined up at the Rafa crossing with aid, probably some of it spoiling, to get in. Uh, as people know, before October 7th, 500 trucks came into Gaza every day with goods and food, medicine, water, you know, all the things that people of Palestine uh, in, in Gaza needed. That has stopped to, to a, a mere trickle, and now it's almost nothing, right? And so this idea of a pier, which would never be able to even come close to 500 shipments a day, I mean, that was admitted to by Biden. I mean, it was going to be a fraction of that. Was never going to make up for the, the lack of, of trucks through the land crossings. So, of course, it, it begged the question, why don't you just tell Israel to keep those crossings open and, and moving, you know? And we know that to date that that pier has had from that pier has brought in almost no supplies to Palestinians. Some aid has gotten in through the pier, but not distributed. It's been brought virtually no aid. So then the question is, you spent $350 million on this thing. You're not bringing in any aid of, uh, to speak of. Uh, so what is it there for? Well, we have some idea because uh, on that in the same operation we talked about, the killed 270 plus Palestinians rescued four Israelis uh, and three Israeli hostages were killed in that operation. Um, the IDF forces entered the uh, the refugee camp in a truck marked as A. And that was apparently a US, United States uh, built vehicle. Uh, we don't know for sure, but it, that might've even come in through the pier. So that raises the question, is the pier just a Trojan horse to bring in military supplies and, and troops? And there's some evidence that that is the case, that that is what's happening. And as you mentioned, the other question is, is, is it also going to be there to take Palestinians out as part of the ethnic cleansing? Is that part of the plan? Now, that we don't think has happened yet, so we don't know. But again, it never seemed calculated, even by the uh, representations by U.S. officials, to, to seriously bring in aid to a population that now is suffering from massive famine and disease. And um, so, yeah, so then one has to wonder if these other, other purposes are really the real purposes. 
well, and of course it could be used for anything, uh, whether or not that was the part of the initial plan for it. Um, but it does seem like there's some sort of motivation in Washington to provide some sort of show of token provision of aid uh, without a willingness to tell Israel what to do. Uh, and I say that because they were also, and I don't know if they still are, dropping food from the sky and in some cases hitting people with it and in some cases killing people hitting, yeah killing people with food yeah. and, and killing people by dropping the food out of reach in the water uh and people drowning trying to get it uh doesn't this suggest that somebody somewhere wants to provide aid but there's just a a, a ban on telling israel to bring it in well it certainly appears that, as you say, that they want to appear to be bringing aid and to bring some symbolic aid. But that really is all it is. Um, I do think that there are political, there is political pressure on the Biden administration to bring aid in. And so, again, they want to appear to be doing that. But they're not doing it in any effective manner. So, yeah, the question is, is that because they don't want to or because Israel really won't let that happen. I guess I guess we don't know all the interplay, but what we do know is very little aid is getting in, even to the effect that I read I, I read an article the other day saying, you know, it, if you're donating to all these aid groups that say they're bringing aid to Gaza, they're not really doing that anymore. There are no crossings open to these aid groups. All they're doing right now, these aid groups, is buying food and water that's already in Gaza and distributing it. And there's not much of that left, okay? They're almost out of food and water. We're very close to the tipping point where you're gonna see massive deaths by starvation and thirst. And you're already seeing photos of the babies dying. I have friends in Gaza who I communicate with nearly every day. And so I know what's happening. I know that those food store, the stores are just, they're running out and we're not replacing it. And um, so whatever the intention is of the Biden administration, they're not doing it. They're not getting aid to people. And it's really, we're going to witness a catastrophe. We've already witnessed a catastrophe, but I, I sadly think the worst is, is, is yet to come. And what do you make of this, uh, of the excuses that are left to the supporters of this? Uh, one, one is there are hostages, but of course they won't uh, do all that would be needed uh, to free the hostages, namely free Palestinian prisoners. Uh, and they brag about freeing four hostages while killing others and oh, by the way, killing a couple hundred human beings that don't count. And then the other excuse seems to be, well, all that is needed is for Hamas to agree to a ceasefire proposal. And yet real or fictional, Hamas keeps agreeing to the darn things. Right. Uh, and, and so what, what's left? What are, what's in people's minds who are still supporting this? Well, if you're talking about Americans who support it, I think most Americans don't understand the dynamics of what is happening on the ground. They do think maybe this is all about hostages and all about defeating Hamas. So that's probably what they think. I think the real, I think the, the truth in terms of Israel's true intentions, uh, I think they know now, and you can hear some Israeli officials say this, and some of the Israeli papers are saying this, that that they're not going to defeat Hamas. They know they can't defeat Hamas. Um, they also know that the hostages um, are not being served, well served at all by this war, that there's been very few that have been rescued. Um, and again, yeah. In fact, there's been a lot that have been killed through Israeli attacks. And again, so what is the purpose here? I mean, I think there's two purposes. And again, I've, I've listened a lot to Israeli commentators on this. One is revenge, that there is a bloodlust for the Palestinians after October 7th. Some of this is just purely revenge type killings. 
But the other thing I, I do think that's happening and the reason why people think it's a genocide, and, and again, we're gleaning that from the, the words of Israeli officials themselves, is the goal seems to be to get rid of the Palestinians, that they want this famine. They want to um, uh, kill Palestinians, as many as they can, and not only um, uh, to kill them, what you, you're also seeing the maiming of children. The, the, there's more child amputees in Gaza than anywhere in the world. I mean, it, it's just, this is a brutal, anti-human, inhumane, um, you can't even call it a war. It's just a massacre uh, that's happening. And of course, on top of that, they've destroyed Gaza, the entire infrastructure of Gaza. I mean, even to the, even to the point you'll see videos of 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 uh, IDF uh, soldiers using these uh, these trucks or, uh, to to just um, dig up roads. I mean, literally, they're even just destroying the roads that are there. They've destroyed mosques and churches and hospitals. It's rubble. They're saying now it'll take thirty years just to remove the rubble. That's before you, you start putting in one nail to rebuild. This is a, 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 you're looking at the attempt to destroy a people. That's why it's a genocide. That is what the definition of a genocide is. So I don't think most Americans understand that. I think many do. That's why you're seeing protest, which is great. But I think most, if you're just listening to the mainstream press, you're not understanding that, that that's what's really happening. And yet it's such an incredible reversal. I, I mean, I grew up in the United States, taught that genocide was the very worst thing. Uh, in fact, I regularly debate people on the topic that we've both written on, abolishing war. Uh, and a leading justification for war is that it supposedly is something different from genocide and a tool for preventing genocide. I mean, this was, this was the excuse for wars, the war that they should have had in Rwanda, the war that they did have in Libya, the, you know, the, the humanitarian wars to stop genocide. Genocide is so evil that it justifies the mass murder of war and the pretense that war and genocide are two completely different things. And now you have genocide on people's computers, live streamed every day. Uh, and you're supposed to deny it, avoid it, pretend it's something else, or support it. It seems like the biggest flip uh, in, in outlook that's ever been asked of of any people. Am I am I exaggerating? You're not exaggerating at all. I mean, that's absolutely the case, and it's being done by an administration that is populated by officials who advocate for humanitarian intervention, as you say, to go to war to prevent genocide. Probably the most notable person being the current head of USAID, Samantha Power, who made a career uh, writing a book again, you know, about the Western uh, failure to prevent genocide, and she's providing cover for this genocide. And actually, a lot of uh, a staff have have quit her office because of that, because they're like, "What are you doing, Samantha? You, this is your whole goal. This is your whole raison d'être." We're not just turning our blind eye to genocide. We're we the United States is complicit in this in a very big way, and so it is an amazing thing. I mean, and so when you listen to these spokespeople for the White House and the State Department speak, first of all, they look embarrassed because they cannot defend what's happening with a straight face, and they have to just. Uh, you know, tie themselves in knots to try to explain what's happening because it's undefensible and unexplainable. Um, and what's happening is more and more people in the U.S. and in the Western countries are waking up to this. And I, I the propaganda is just not working like it used to for the reason you're saying. We, many people thought we were the good guys. We were the ones that stopped this sort of thing. But we're doing it. And as you say, we're doing it in a way that for the first time probably in history, you can see it every day on your phones, right? 
the videos, the, the photos of, of, again, massacres, babies dying, children under rubble, Israeli soldiers, you know, taking glee in killing, in destroying people's homes. It's unbelievable. It's unbelievable. Um, but it's happening. Do you think that do you think that the sale and purchase and shipment and reception of weapons has been made unquestionable? Because once you once you make unquestionable where the weapons are coming from, everything makes sense. Israel is doing this horrible thing and Biden is so upset and frustrated with Israel and Blinken is heartbroken and so forth. If you if you avoid questioning where the weapons are coming from uh i mean i think for a great part people just have no idea that one of the major things the u.s does is arm most of the rest of the world that the primary thing nato does is deal weapons that most of the dictatorships on earth are armed by the united states but people are told at least some of us are screaming it at the top of our lungs day and night that all the weapons are coming mostly from the United States and a little bit from other Western allies to Israel. And if the weapons stopped, Israel couldn't do what it's doing with the weapons. And yet I think people must believe that that's just unquestionable. You can't, you can't say anything about that. That's just business. Does that, does that make any sense? No, it does. And that is the problem that Israel's gotten away with what they've gotten away with for so long because they, generally know that there is no red line going back to how we started the conference there is no red line that will end that aid now there have been moments in history where presidents have prevailed on israel to stop killing civilians by threatening to cut off aid ronald reagan did strangely enough um you probably know that story he called uh, menachem begin in 1982 told him to stop killing civilians in Lebanon and 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 um Menachem Begin for the most part listened to him um and uh, Eisenhower you may recall uh ended the Suez uh, canal crisis uh, between Egypt and Israel um also uh with a phone call and uh, John F Kennedy of course tried very very hard to start putting um some limits on Israel. Of course, then he was killed. Uh, aside from those few instances, though, there, Israel has taken for granted they're going to get U.S. support no matter what, and that's based. That's been true, and that seems true now. I don't see the Biden administration cutting off aid. Uh, Trump's made it clear if he's president, he's going to let Israel do whatever they want. Sadly, even Bobby Kennedy, one of the you know probably the most the third party candidate who has the most chance of winning. He's terrible on this issue. I mean, there's just so much agreement on this amongst the rulers that, yeah, it seems like like it's a sacrosanct thing, this aid to Israel. And that's what people are challenging really for the first time ever on a, on a mass scale. People are saying, no, no, we have to question this. We have to stop this aid. Um, we have to at least condition the aid and and but. Our, our our officials are not listening. I think the U.S. public is ahead on this one and uh, behind on Ukraine. Uh, yes. You know, and, and I think it, it, so there are people who are, are willing to comprehend the idea of, of cutting off weapons. Uh, and yet the weapons just keep flowing and people for the most part, not all those people who were with us at the White House the other day, but for the most part, people think there's nothing they can do about it. How do we how do we even start to move from there to no more war? Yeah. Well, I think you're seeing it. I think you're seeing that start. I think the protests on campus are a start. I think the protests in DC are a start. I and people need to understand that things don't change overnight. It will take protracted struggle, protract, protracted protests, the building of a peace movement that was pretty much broken after the invasion of Iraq in 2003. But it's happening. It is beginning. And we just need to keep going. And, and, and you cannot be wedded to results. 
you cannot expect to necessarily see the fruits of your labor, certainly not quickly. You have to do it because it is the right thing to do because you can sleep at night if you do it. And that's really what it's about. And you have to enjoy that struggle. You have to be a happy warrior, but not make it not to make war, but to make peace. You have to be a happy peacemaker. And, uh, you know, David, you and I were older than a lot of the people protesting. And we've been doing this our whole adult lives. And, and again, seen a lot of wars that we were unable to stop. But you keep doing it yeah, because it's the right thing to do, because it gives your life meaning. It's the only meaning really that I see in life right now. I couldn't agree more. Uh, I'm going to see if I can find something uh, that we disagree on because I haven't yet. Uh, <laughs> uh, we've got just a couple minutes left. Um, a lot of the people at these rallies, a lot of the chants uh, turn some people off. They're not anti-war. They're pro the other side of the war. The guy on the wall behind you, Che Guevara, glorified for taking part in war on the right side rather than the wrong side. People right. Screaming, yay, Hamas, get Israel, revolution, intifada, resistance is justified when people are occupied and so forth. Could we not have even bigger crowds uh, if we were smart enough to oppose both sides of every war without equating them, without blaming the victims, any of this nonsense, but not supporting violence? Yes, although I do think, David, that when you say, for example, resistance is justified, that could be all kinds of resistance, yeah, right? Yeah, but um, it isn't in, a lot of okay. the, in the minds of a lot of the people saying that. Yeah. And, and you know that's but, but, true. Yeah, that's true. Uh, but also, look, I agree, and I think there are different ways to couch things, for sure. And I think we could be a lot better doing that. Um. Uh, so I would agree agree with you to that extent that we we our slogans need to be better, as you say. To we we need to reach out to more Americans. As you, Americans are good people, you know. As Noam Chomsky always said, if you look at the polls, the Americans are pretty much right all the time, right? And if you can't get the people in Middle America to join you at these protests, you're failing. You know, we, we have to find a way to do that. So I agree with you that that has to be, you know, we have to win people over. That has to be the goal and not not to turn people away. At the same time, you understand the passion people have because they're seeing something so terrible happen. And you understand why, you know, uh, there's a lot of anger. There's a lot of anger out there that's being expressed. A lot of righteous anger, and it's it's understandable. Again, I've I've never seen anything like this in my life. I've known it's been happening. It's not that this hasn't happened. You and I lived through the war in Central America, where the grisly, grisly things were happening there. The war in the Congo, which is still going on, has days. been terrible. But but none of these things did we see what was happening in real time. I mean, I, that's what's crazy. And that's what's making people so upset. So I understand, at least understand that passion that, that, that people are showing. So. Well, well, we got to make ending the war more important than expressing the passion uh, for its own sake. Um, we've maybe we maybe we don't disagree on anything. We've been speaking with Dan Kovalik and his latest book is The Case for Palestine, Why It Matters and Why You Should Care. We will have links up at talkworldradio.org. Dan, thanks for everything you're doing and for coming on Talk World Radio. Thank you, David. I appreciate you. I appreciate all your work. This is Talk World Radio. I'm David Swanson. Take action at rootsaction.org. Help end war at worldbeyondwar.org. Read or listen to today's Peace Almanac entry at peacealmanac.org. All past shows can be heard at talkworldradio.org. Talk World Radio is produced in Charlottesville, Virginia, and syndicated by Pacifica Network. There is no way to peace. Peace is the way.